welcome to class five in the ongoing saga of the Vietnam War. And today, finally, we're getting to uh, JFK in Vietnam, and we'll spend, I, su I assume, uh, pretty much the whole class doing that. Uh, as I said before, this is the area that uh, I think the American people, the public at large, probably is more interested in than any other thing. Uh, the whole idea of Kennedy uh, being the fallen hero, slain before he had a chance to, you know, bring enduring peace to the world is one that uh, has always kind of been in the back of uh, a lot of people's minds from the 60s generation and, of course, got a lot of credence uh, when Oliver Stone put out the movie about JFK. So we're going to study the, the Kennedy record. I think uh, there's a, a book out several years ago, about a decade ago now, by a, an eminent historian in which he had several people write articles about JFK. And in his introduction, he makes a telling point that you have to judge Kennedy not by the myth or the image or what he might have done, but what actually happened. And he had his chances, and generally, in most cases, he blew them. And so this is going to be fairly critical. I think, you know, I, I tend to give Kennedy a lot of responsibility for the war in Vietnam. And we ended by talking a little bit about that last week. Um, what I want to start with today, actually, is uh, uh, Kennedy in other parts of the world, because I think that's very important. One thing that we're going to see is that one of the main reasons Kennedy takes Vietnam so seriously is because he has so many problems elsewhere. Uh, the world is a very complex, complicated, and difficult place, and John Kennedy is very young and not uh, exactly an expert, uh, especially uh, with regard to foreign policy. And Kennedy is also a very hardline Cold Warrior, uh, and he's going to run into trouble, specifically in his early days of his administration, in Cuba and in Laos. And we're going to discuss those as kind of a prelude to Vietnam. Uh, within 100 days of taking over, Kennedy suffers a major embarrassment, a major defeat, a fiasco. And this is in Cuba. There is, there is Kennedy's arch uh, enemy, his nemesis, uh, Fidel Castro. Uh, throughout the 1960s, America had two enemies. The symbols of anti-Americanism were Fidel Castro and Ho Chi Minh. And in fact, uh, you know, with good reason, they tended to be the biggest thorns. They exposed the limits of American power. The United States, remember, ends World War II with this amazing power. And throughout the 1960s, it basically believes it can do anything. It can really have a, a major hegemony over the world. And more than anybody, it's, it's Ho and Castro who expose that. And in fact, Castro does it even before Ho Chi Minh. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail. I think you know the story. Castro takes over uh, uh, in uh, January 1st, 1959, uh, overthrows the, uh, the dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista, who had very close ties with American political leaders and, of course, American businessmen and American gamblers. Havana was kind of like the Vegas of the day. Uh, the United States is essentially hostile to Castro from the start. This is a big historical debate, you know, when Castro became a communist or whether the U.S. tried to make overtures. But in fact, the United States never was terribly responsive to the Castro regime. Uh, even though, like Ho, it was a nationalist and communist revolution. In fact, I think it's fairly clear Ho was far more of a communist in the early days than Castro ever was. I mean, Fidel evolved into that. I mean, Ho was from, the, from pretty much the start. Uh, but the United, the United States Eisenhower, the Eisenhower-Nixon administration was fairly hostile to Castro from the beginning and actually had begun making plans to somehow overthrow Fidel from the start. And this included both overt and covert operations, things like uh, trying to assassinate him. Uh, in the 1970s, there was a, a Senate committee to investigate the CIA, CIA, the Church Committee, and it exposed, it came up with uh, over 20 different attempts, different plots to assassinate Fidel. Some ranging from serious invasions, and we'll talk about in a minute. Some were absurd, you know, poisoning his cigars, making his hair fall out, things like that. It's kind of Boris Badenoff type stuff. Uh, but the point was, there was clearly a commitment to do something about Castro, and Kennedy inherits this. Remember, during the debates with Nixon, he, he, baited, Nick, the, he baited Nixon over Cuba. You're soft on Cuba. You're not doing anything to get rid of Castro. And Nixon couldn't say, well, we have secret plans. We're going we're gonna to get rid of him. So uh, uh, Kennedy inherits this Cuban mess and really turns it, turns it even worse, makes it even worse. Uh, uh, in mid-April 1961, he's not even been president for 100 days, he authorizes an invasion of Cuba by Cuban emigres. Uh, depending on where you stand on this one, they were either freedom fighters or terrorists. They were essentially based in Miami, where they're still very strong today. They had been training in Nicaragua. And uh, they invade at a place called the uh, 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 Baya de Cocinas, the Bay of Pigs. 
And if you know anything about it, they were routed. I mean, Castro himself was directing troops at the beach. They meet the, the uh, uh, invaders and they wipe them out. The Cubans had been led to believe that Kennedy would provide American Air Force air support. So they're assuming that American airplanes, American fighters are going to bomb the Cuban troops at the beach, thereby creating uh, an invasion force. Right? Well, Kennedy didn't do that. And I don't think that was ever promised, but clearly there were indications that Kennedy would somehow help out. He had authorized the invasion. There's no question about that. So the Bay of Pigs is a disaster. I mean, they, they kill a lot of the invaders. Many of them are imprisoned. I think the, the last uh, a Bay of Pigs prisoner was just released from Cuba a couple years ago. So Kennedy, less than 100 days into office, who has this sterling rhetoric in his inaugural address, really looks, really looks foolish. It's a total fiasco. And this is important for a couple of reasons with regard to Vietnam. One, it creates real animosity between him and his military leaders. And two, it forces him to shift attention to other parts of the world. First, with regard to military mistrust, the military essentially took the fall for the Bay of Pigs. Okay? Kennedy gives a speech where he says, it's my responsibility, I'm the president. But internally, within Washington, D.C., blame started to fly all over. And Kennedy blamed the military. He thought that they had uh, given him bad advice, that they hadn't come clean with it. Well, in fact, the military was not terribly enthused about the Bay of Pigs invasion. David Shoup, who was Marine Commandant at the time, in fact, came in with a map overlay of Cuba. And he put it down and showed that it covered you know, a fairly significant portion of the southeast, that it's a big island. And he said, you know, you don't realize what you're getting into, and everybody dismissed that. So when the Bay of Pigs goes bad, Kennedy essentially blames the military for it. In fact, um, Kennedy tells Arthur Schlesinger, who's his biographer, hagiographer, uh, he tells Schlesinger, I hope you kept a full account of that, the Bay of Pigs. You can be damn sure that the CIA has its record and the Joint Chiefs of Staff theirs. You better make sure we have a record over here. So Kennedy's basically saying the CIA is going to come up with their version, the military is going to come up with their version, we need our version of it too. So when the stuff hits the fan, we won't be blamed for it. All right? This is going to create a level of mistrust between Kennedy and the military that's going to be obvious throughout the rest of his time and then into the LBJ years with regard to Vietnam. Uh, Kennedy, in fact, brings Maxwell Taylor back out of retirement <coughs> to head a commission to investigate the Bay of Pigs. And Taylor concludes essentially that the military blew it. Kennedy loves it. This is what they brought Taylor there to say. So, uh, and then Taylor later becomes chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So Kennedy basically, even though publicly says, yes, it was my fault, I'm responsible, internally is blaming the military uh, for the Bay of Pigs, and basically um, had lost confidence in the military after that. Um, basically, Kennedy had been, at Wal uh, George Kay, a famous uh, historian, says he was hoist he had been hoist with the petard of his own campaign charges that the Eisenhower administration was soft on communism. You know, he's blaming Eisenhower and Nixon. He can't do it either. Um, this forces him to a shift attention elsewhere. And in a very candid and clear statement, Walt Whitman Rostow, uh, I'll talk more about him later, it's a wonderful name. Uh, uh, there were three, uh, well, let me go back a little further. There was a, uh, Walt Rostow was the uh, uh, policy planning committee chair and later, um, National Security Advisor to Johnson, and really one of the hawks of Vietnam, unrepentant to this day. And uh, he had two brothers who were also uh, very well known, one active in government. Uh, their three names are Walt Whitman Rostow, Eugene Debs Rostow, and Ralph Emerson Rostow. Their father was a, a Russian socialist emigre, and I suspect he probably spun in his grave a bit when he saw what his three kids were doing. Uh, but Walt Whitman Rostow, who at the time was the uh, chairman of the Policy Planning Council, said, quote, clean-cut success in Vietnam could ease the political problems caused by the Bay of Pigs failure. We, we blew it in Cuba. Right? We need to find uh, a, a solution elsewhere because we look bad. We look like fools. Uh, the chief of the advisory group in Vietnam, a man whose name I'll come up with, I'll mention again later, Lionel Magar, uh, Magar said that there was a strong determination to stop the present deterioration of U.S. prestige after the Bay of Pigs. So we blew it in Cuba. Um, we're going to have to find a solution elsewhere. Okay? Cuba by itself really made Kennedy look bad and caused some serious problems. But making matters worse, there was another crisis um, in an area much closer to Vietnam and Laos. I couldn't find a good map of Laos itself, so I just 
rehash this one. Laos, as you can see, shares a very long border with Vietnam, mostly northern Vietnam. And in fact, Laos would be a major supply route. The Ho Chi Minh Trail runs through much of Laos, all right? So as you can see str strategically and geographically, it's part of Indochina and it shares a border with Vietnam. And Americans always considered Laos, in a sense, to be a target of Vietnamese imperialism. They always believed that the Vietnamese would try to take over Laos as well, all right? Um, so Laos is very important. Uh, at the same time, then, that Kennedy has to deal with Cuba, there, there is also a crisis that has been ongoing in Laos, which is getting worse, and he has to deal with that, too. In fact, at a meeting just about a week after the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy meets with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and they begin discussing American troop involvement in Laos as well. Right? Just a little bit of background on Laos, because I think it's interesting. I mean, we mention Laos and Cambodia sometimes, but we don't really go much into it. But I think that this is really quite telling. It it's really parallels what's happening in Vietnam. Uh, in fact, I think I mentioned before, when Eisenhower briefs Kennedy on January 19th, 1961, the day before Kennedy's inaugural, what area does he tell him to watch out for? Laos. He doesn't think Vietnam's a problem. He thinks Laos is the key, and this is the area that Kennedy has to be vigilant about. So that's a far greater, more overriding concern, this Laotian mess, which is how they often refer to it. In Laos, there was an insurgency, a group called the Pathet Lao. And these, they were communists, right? The Pathet Lao is a communist insurgency. The United States wants to prevent the path that Lao from coming to power, and it wants to create a pro-American government in Laos. All right. There is in Laos a royal government. Basically, we refer to it as the Royal Lao government. And in the 1950s, the United States, just as it was helping pay the bills, basically paying the bills in southern Vietnam, was paying the bills in Laos too. It accounted for 65% of the Royal Laotian government's revenues in the late 1950s. So the United States is pumping tons of money into Laos to maintain the royal government and to prevent the path that Lao from gaining influence. Now, the premier in Laos is a man named Suvana Fuma. Fuma is a troublemaker because he's a fill in the blank. Communist? No. Maybe just as bad, he's a neutralist. Fuma is a nationalist and a neutralist. He's not a communist. Not at all. All right. Suvana Fuma, hoping to avoid a civil war in Laos, tries to bring the Pathet Lao into his government. Not as leaders, but as members of a coalition government. Now, what do the Americans want? The Americans want Suvana Fuma to eliminate the path at Lao. Suvana Fuma wants to basically bring them in, co-opt them, as it were. All right? So where the Americans want the government to use the army to eliminate the path at Lao, Suvana Fuma and others believe that if they crack down on the path at Lao and try to repress them through coercion and violence, what will the path at Lao do? Where will they look for help? Think of the map. China, China or even more immediate. North, North Vietnam. So Suvana Fuma says, if we try to crush the Path at Lao, we're guaranteeing an alliance between Ho Chi Minh and the Path at Lao. We're guaranteeing that the Path at Lao will get aid from Northern Vietnam and from the Chinese, both. So we will push them even further into opposition and almost guarantee bigger problems. This is Suvana Fuma's line. Right? They believe that a compromise with the Path at Lao was, was essential to assure Laotian independence from China or from northern Vietnam. So Suvana Fuma then continues to pursue a coalition government. But he has two major enemies in this. One, of course, the Americans oppose a coalition government. And within Laos, there are military leaders who make alliances with the CIA and other American groups on the ground. And essentially, they and the Americans are basically opposing Suvana Fuma. So there is not only an American opposition, but within Laos, a right-wing military opposition to any kind of a coalition government. Right? And American officials, through both private and unofficial, private, unofficial, and official channels, make sure that the anti-coalition groups in Laos are encouraged and supported. 
So the United States, even though it's sending support to Laos, is opposed to Suvana Fuma, not because he's a communist, but because he is a neutralist, and he wants to bring the path at Lao into the government. All right? The United States then is trying to establish an anti-Fuma uh, coalition. All right? However, once the Americans began to encourage these right-wing military officers, they could not control it. So what do these guys do? They overthrow Suvana Fuma. So there is a coup in Laos, and a new premier comes in. I will just put his first name down because that's how they were often referred. Fui. Uh, well, I'll write it down, but don't. It's Laotian names can be quite long. Fui Sananakone. All right. Um, and he replaces Suvana Fuma. He's the new premier. Fui Sananakone repudiates. Fuma's overtures and agreements with the path that Lao to allow them into the government. And he excludes them from the government and essentially lets it be known that his goal will not be a coalition government, but to crush the path that Lao. All right, so everything falls apart. Now, what does the United States do? It increases its aid to Laos after the coup, giving Fui Sanana Kone $55 million in 1960, which was a tremendous increase over previous years. Doesn't sound like a lot of money, but compared to what the U.S. had been doing in Laos, it was a significant increase. <laughs> Humanitarian intervention. Of course it would, because, you know, you're fighting the forces of darkness and evil. Uh, now, the, the thing also to remember is the path that Lao was amenable to neutralism, probably, as in most of these cases, with the idea that ultimately they would take over. But they were amenable to a coalition government, and they had fairly decent relations with Suvana Fuma. I can't remember the name, but there was um, uh, actually uh, 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 one of Fuma's brothers. They referred to him as the Red Prince because he was a communist. He was very active and supportive of the Path at Lao. So the, the difference between Fuma and the Path at Lao may not be as great as one would normally assume. There really were, there was room for accommodation there. In fact, the royal family itself was split. Uh, I can't remember his name because it's one of those that has like 15 letters in it, but there was the, the Red Prince was, was uh, uh, Fuma's uh, brother. I want to say Fumi no Savan, but that's somebody else, so uh, I, I won't go with that one. Um, so the Americans support, American support increases after the coup, um, but it doesn't have a whole lot of effect because, do you have a question? Oh, the American um, support basically goes to the military, and a lot of it is used for private gain rather than to actually uh, improve the government, create reform, or anything like that, okay? So what happens? Well, the Americans support the coup. The royal government turns ever further to the right. And what does this do to the path at Lao? Well, in fact, in this case, it actually strengthens them because the path at Lao can now effectively use propaganda claiming that Fui's government is nothing but a puppet of America, uh, um, it's corrupt, it's indifferent to the sufferings of the, the Laotian people. And, and those all work. Those are effective because, in fact, most of the American money was being siphoned off. There was a great deal of corruption. Uh, the government was, in fact, if not a puppet of the United States, clearly subservient to American goals. Uh, so that worked. And, in fact, the, the path that Lao um, actually get more popular. And as Suvana Fuma predicted, they also turn toward northern Vietnam and China for more assistance. So what happens? In 1960, Fui's government, Fui Sananakone's government is overthrown. All right? But not by the path that Lao, by another group of army officers and neutralists. And who returns to power? Suvana Fuma. So Suvana Fuma is back in power. This is all very complicated, but it's worth, it's a good story. It's a good story, all right? Suvana Fuma is back in power, all right? Suvana Fuma agrees to come back with the condition that Laos, again, have a neutralist foreign policy. What does the U.S. think about this? They remain very distrustful, distrustful mistrustful of Suvana Fuma, all right? And in fact, they continue to provide military assistance to anti-Fuma groups, including Fui Sananakone, who hasn't left the scene. <laughs> this would be a great uh, a play or a movie, wouldn't it? The United States continues to relentlessly oppose Laotian neutrality. And so, and you could almost see this coming, who does Suvana Fuma turn to finally for help and for support and for a coalition? The path at Lao. So the two groups 
that the United States wanted to keep apart have now formed an alliance in large measure because U.S. pressure and U.S. support to anti-government forces there. All right? In fact, Suvana Fuma himself sends government goodwill missions to Hanoi and Beijing. So the government is officially now hooking up with northern Vietnam and China. America's greatest fear was basically the result of American policy in Laos. All right? And of course, as soon as Suvana Fuma makes these overtures to Beijing and Hanoi, what's the United States say? See, we told you so. We knew all along you couldn't trust the guy. He's no better. He's a neutralist commie. What's the difference? They're all alike. If it looks like a duck and talks like a duck and everything else, it's the duck test, right? So the state, yeah. Was there, was there anybody at the time who commented on this in terms of like social critics that recognized it for what it was and um, questioned the morality not a whole of lot. the intervention? No, I mean, you know, the intellectual elite has never been terribly critical of American foreign policy. It's not a big story. I mean, I'm sure there internally there are people who are questioning it. Uh, in fact, but but no, I mean, it's not like you're going to have movements or protests or speeches or anything like that. It was pretty much done. I mean, it's Laos. It's a little country. Who even knows where Indochina is? You know, Kennedy, in fact, Kennedy had to be taught how to say it. In his first several press conferences, he kept saying Laos, Laos, and finally they got to him, and later on he learned to pronounce it. But, and it was just wasn't that important. You know, it was just another little piece of the Cold War. And, you know, why wouldn't? I mean, Suvana Fuma is a, a commie. You've got to get rid of him, right? So, I mean, it's not like you would have reason to suspect this anyway. There, there weren't a whole lot of, you know, kind of Noam Chomsky types out there in 1960, you know, raising the, the alarms or anything like that. So Suvana Fuma confirms America's suspicions by making these overtures to Hanoi and Beijing. And so the U.S., the State Department, the CIA is all determined to get rid of them. And there's another coup. And in 1960, the American-equipped army of Fui San Anacone comes back into power. All right. What does the coup do? Makes things worse. All right. Now, not only do the Chinese and North Vietnamese support the path at Lao, but now the Soviet Union gets involved as well. And so the Soviet Union now has a stake in Laos. And this is almost something out of like Strange Lover Catch 22, right? Uh, I mean, you have this insignificant. Dirt water, one of the poorest, if not the poorest country in the world, with no strategic value, no really necessary minerals, nothing to recommend itself, which is now the site of the biggest powers in the world getting involved. The Chinese, the Soviet Union, the United States are all deeply involved in Laos, an area that is no interest to America, of no material or structural or ideological interest to the United States, has now become a pot boiler. It's, it's, it's really quite remarkable, isn't it? So um, the Soviet Union, Beijing, Han Beijing, Hanoi, and Moscow all now are su supporting Laos. What was the uh, uh, policy, foreign policy, and the nature of the government in Thailand during these years? Thailand, actually, I was going to mention that, and I didn't want to. Thailand is rightist, and they support um, Fui San Anakone. Thailand has a military government, which is getting a lot of American aid. And the Thais are putting pressure also on uh, Fuma and the path at Lao, and they also want a... Uh, 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 Fui San Anakone and, and this anti-communist government in power, right? right? And again, I mean, so you have Bangkok involved in it too, which is, you know, pretty much the biggest power in, in Southeast Asia. So it's, it's quite remarkable that in a small country it's become really a, a, a centerpiece of the Cold War. Yeah? Uh, am I hearing right that, that until the U.S. really forced the issue, neither Red China or the Soviet Union were intricately involved in any way? No. Uh, it, it really didn't occur until like late 1960 when you start to see Beijing and Moscow get involved. And, you know, the United States had issues with path, the path at Lao, but things in Laos weren't so bad. I mean, Suvana Fuma was not a communist. He was a neutralist who basically was trying to ride the shoals to try to kind of nuance his way around things. And as I said, his brother was a supporter of the path at Lao, the, the Red Prince. So... Um, no, I mean, Beijing and Moscow don't really have any great interest in this. There is a, a huge debate, which we're not going to get into, as to North Vietnam's interest. I mean, there are those who claim that Ho Chi Minh was always an imperialist who wanted to control all of Indochina. And in fact, remember, when he creates the Communist Party in 1931, it's the Indochinese Communist Party, not the Vietnamese Communist Party. One thing I didn't mention, in 1951, the party is reconstituted as the Lao Dong or the Workers' Party, and it becomes a Vietnamese party. But for 20 years, it was an Indo-Chinese party. So, you know, I, I don't think it's, you know, uh, outrageous to suggest that Ho probably always did envision an Indo-Chinese confederation. But as far as Beijing and Moscow, no, there's, there's not really much interest there. Um, it's the nationalism of Suvana comparable to either Ho's or Castro's? 
I, I know because I think Ho and Castro were, in fact, communists as well. Suvana Fuma wasn't. He was, he was a king. He was a royal government. You know? So really, that, that much less uh, oh, absolutely. of a communist. Yeah. Oh, Neither absolutely. Castro. Yeah. Yeah. Did the Vietnamese play a role in setting up the Pathet Lao? The Pathet Lao, they support them a little bit, but the Vietnamese aren't terribly wealthy. I mean, the Vietnamese, yeah, there's some help. It's limited. I mean, they just can't really do much more than that. I mean, they, you know, they, they moved across borders and whatnot. Supplies, help, advisors. I mean, the main help was things like advisors, training, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Sure. Uh, wh who did you say was the uh, head of state after the American back coup? Um Fui comes back in. Yeah, Fui Sinanakone. Yeah, yeah. Kind of starts to roll off your tongue after you say it a few times, right? All right. <laughs> so the Soviet Union actually begins to airlift supplies to the path that Lao and Suvana Fuma, who are now fighting on the same side. <laughs> okay. So this, this is still going on in late 1960, early 1961, when Kennedy comes to power and Eisenhower leaves office. And in their meeting on January 19th, Eisenhower tells him to stand firm against any coalition government. Some Americans have referred to this as the specter of neutralism, not the specter of communism, the specter of neutralism. Because if you look at what the U.S. does in South Asia with regard to India, you see that the United States opposes the governments of India, Nehru, and favors Pakistan for the same reason. And in fact, Eisenhower, Eisenhower does say the U.S. should intervene only as a last desperate measure to save Laos, but he says if we do intervene, we can handle it, so it's not a problem, all right? So then, in early 1961, as the U.S. looks at Southeast Asia, at Indochina specifically, it has two of its golden boys, Ngo Din Ziem in southern Vietnam and Fui Sinanakone in Laos in charge. Both of them are dependent upon American support, but... Both of them are also floundering when Kennedy comes to office. Laos, in fact, is a more immediate concern, however. And Kennedy and Laos decides to bite the bullet, take a compromise. All right? In fact, um, there was a, an international commission, Cambodia, Britain, and the Soviet Union, which put forth a plan for a ceasefire and negotiations among all parties. Pathet Lao, Suvana Fuma, and Fui Sinanakone in Laos. It would include communists, neutralists, the military, everybody, a true coalition government. Um, the United States had great misgivings about this, uh, but in the spring of 1961, the major groups in Laos, the Path at Laos, Suvana Fuma, and Fui Sanana Kone, begin to talk. They begin to negotiate in uh, May of 61 um, with uh, the goal of creating a coalition, a neutral government. Right? And uh, for his part, Kennedy sends Averill Harriman, which is a name you'll hear about again, uh, as the American negotiator in Geneva. Harriman is very well known. He has been, uh, was the governor of New York. He's from the famous Harriman uh, family, which had a, a billionaire family with railroad interest in the uh, 19th century uh, and banking interest, too, I believe. Um, uh, governor of New York, one of Roosevelt's chief negotiators during World War II, uh, later... Uh, uh, the American negotiator in the Paris peace talks and the Vietnam War, you know, just really famous guy. Harriman is the American negotiator uh, in Geneva in uh, 1961 and 62. To make a long story short, um, Suvana Fuma returns as prime minister and Laos has a neutral foreign policy. All right. When the talks begin in May of 61, it's clear this is how it's going to turn out. The United States, despite its money and its support, its arming of the Laotian, the Royal Laotian military, cannot maintain Fui Sinanakone in power because he really has no popular backing. Suvana Fuma does. Right? So in May of 61, when the, um, the uh, negotiations begin, it's clear how they're going to turn out. So what happens? Richard Nixon, who was essentially the party, you know, the, uh, what do they call it in Britain, the, the party, the rump party or whatever, government in exile, I forget. Nixon is essentially the titular head of the Republican Party since he lost in 1960. And Nixon begins to blast Kennedy for being soft on communism, for being weak, for not only losing Cuba, but now because he has allowed Laos to establish a neutral government, he's gone soft on communism. Okay? So Kennedy then, in both... Cuba and Laos, you see my, my clever little joke there, lousing up, uh, has, has suffered two failures. 
right? And in a second, we'll talk about this, this whole idea and how these things lead him to take a hard line elsewhere. But something else happens, which I think is important, and I address that in Masters of War. This also creates military problems for Kennedy at home. In both Cuba and Laos, grave civil military problems emerged, which would haunt the Americans for the entire Vietnam War. You know, as you know, constitutionally, who is the, the commander of the American forces? President of the United States is civilian control, right? Uh, and generally, the president is supposed to do this with the consent and advice of his military. Um, however, the military sensed in both Cuba and Laos that it was kind of being set up, that Kennedy was going into areas that the military was not enthused about, and if things went bad, who would be blamed for it? They would. So what you start to see then in Laos in early 1961 is an attempt to pin down the president and by this I mean what you will see time and again is whenever the military talks about Cuba, Laos, Vietnam or whatever they will always say we need guidance from the White House we need a clear detailed policy determination from Kennedy we're not going to go in here put our butts on the line if Kennedy doesn't tell us exactly what he wants and in fact in April of 61 Kennedy meets with the military about Laos and what do they tell him? We need 60 to 140,000 troops. Everyone's taken that as an indication that the military was gung-ho, wanted to go into Laos and fight a war. In fact, it was the opposite. Basically, they were saying, is, this is what it takes, and if we're going to go in, you're going to give us that, because we're not going to go in short of that, because we'll get blamed for it. Right? And this begins something that you're going to see time and time and time again in the Vietnam period. The military asks the president for something that the president probably is not going to give him, but when the president turns him down, who takes responsibility? He does. So you start to see this already, an attempt to pin down Kennedy. What should we do? We're not going to do anything unless you give us clear, detailed guidance. And you'll see this time and again, whenever the military talks, we're looking for guidance from the White House. We need Kennedy to tell us precisely what he wants. So they're not going to say, yeah, we're gung-ho, let's go in. They want, they want a, a clear signals from the White House about that. Right? So we haven't talked about Vietnam. We've talked about Cuba and Laos, but these areas are critically important. They create the nature of civil military relations in both cases because Kennedy doesn't trust the military. He blames them for Cuba, and in Laos, he thinks that they're weak. I think, uh, who was it, maybe uh, Ted Sorensen or Roger Hillsman later said that he, it was pathetic. The military was so weak and wimpy, they wouldn't even fight in Laos, right? And so uh, Kennedy and the military distrust each other, and it also forces him to turn attention elsewhere because, you know, he's inaugurated on January 20th. By May, February, March, April, four months later, he suffered two major defeats. Cuba, clearly a defeat, and Laos, even though it's a neutral government, isn't really any better. So he's getting hammered, hammered hard by his political opponents. You were going to pay any price, bear any burden, fight any foe. You know, in Cuba, you embarrassed yourself, and in Laos, you accept a neutral government, right? So Kennedy really is on the ropes in, uh, in early 1961. Okay. Around this time, too, he begins to seriously address Vietnam. Now, Vietnam isn't a major issue yet. Why? What was the story in the late 50s? ZM and but I mean, from, with regard to the U.S., as the U.S. looks at Vietnam in the 1950s, late 1950s, what's it think? Is it alarmed at what's happening there? No, it's, it's, it's successful. The U.S. essentially thinks that Vietnam's in pretty good shape, okay? All right, they're a bit immune to what's happening there, but they can't stay that way much longer. All right, so um, Kennedy has to address the situation in Vietnam at the same time he's trying to deal with Cuba and Laos. And ultimately, because of his failures in places like Cuba and Laos and elsewhere, he's going to have to take Vietnam up a few notches and continue to do so. The first meeting he has regarding Vietnam actually occurs in January of 1961. And uh, he meets with his advisors to discuss a recent visit by General Edward Lansdale. Anybody know anything about Lansdale? He's really, truly one of the remarkable characters in American military history. Has anybody ever um, uh, read uh, either The Ugly American by, uh, who was it, Birder and Lederick and, uh, Lederer and Burdick, and uh, what's the one Graham Greene wrote? Oh, my God. The Graham Greene novel about Vietnam. The... The Quiet American. The Quiet American and the Ugly American, both of those are based on Edward Lansdale. Lansdale was actually an ad advertising executive who got an Air Force commission 
as an expert in psychological operations, psyops, psychological warfare. This is a term which you'll often see with regard to Vietnam, psyops. And Lansdale's first, yeah. Not to bog this down too much, but how do you go from being an ad exec to a psyops professional? What better training for it? <laughs> Why not? I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you did he really have any formal kind of skills in this, or other than being an ad exec? He was an expert. You can convince Americans to buy soup and toothpaste. You know, you can convince them. And his his first posting is a great success. He's in the Philippines after World War II. There's a communist Hawk rebellion, and Lansdale is the advisor to the uh, government. Um, there and uh, I mean does wonderful things for example one of his favorite things was he, he would prey on the local culture they're like their superstitions and things and uh, some of the the particular group I forget which group in the Philippines uh, believed in spirits and ghosts and things like that so quite often um, uh, Lansdale the government forces would capture and kill a Huck soldier and Lansdale would have him hang him upside down from a tree and drain all his blood out and then they would call the villagers there and tell them that vampires did that. And vampires would suck the blood out from all the communists. Stuff like that. Uh, Lansdale also has <laughs> my favorite Lansdale story. Uh, with regard to Cuba, uh, the attempt to overthrow Castro was called Operation Mongoose. And, Ca and, and actually, Lansdale was working on it. Lansdale's great idea, I, I guess they had just invented this, this technology and no one had really known about it, was Cuba was a Catholic island, right? He was going to create a 50-foot tall hologram of Jesus Christ that he would flash in the sky on Easter Sunday and pipe in a voice from the background telling the people to overthrow Fidel Castro. All right? Uh, cooler heads prevailed and told Ed to go play with his Legos in the corner, I guess. And I make fun of him, and, and there's a lot to make fun of. But Lansdale, I think, is one of the few Americans who understood that the United States was dealing with a foreign country and a different culture. And you really ought to try to understand it. And that is his virtue. That's why I don't think he should be, he, that's why I think he should be more than a footnote. I mean, Lansdale's close to ZM. He's deeply committed to the government there. But at the same time, he realizes that we're Westerners. We do things differently than Vietnamese do. And we really should try to understand them and their culture. And that's why, I mean, if you look at his records or his documents uh, up in the LBJ library, um, you can read 10 Lansdale memos. And he's writing memos every day. People must have thought, God, this guy's a pain in the butt. And nine of the memos are going to be about soothsayers in Vietnam and Vietnamese superstitions and whatnot. But one of them is going to be a gem because he's going to talk about a conversation he had with a Vietnamese officer who talked about how bad morale was or how the Vietnamese really didn't like the Americans there. He understands. He makes an attempt to understand Vietnamese culture, and very few Americans do that, which is why I think there's some virtue. That's background on Lansdale. Kennedy's first introduction to Vietnam actually comes at a meeting with Lansdale, who had just been there. He had been kind of informally going back and forth since the, since the 50s. And Lansdale presents what, what whoever was taking the notes at that meeting refers to as grim views. So Eisenhower says Vietnam's OK. Kennedy's under the impression that it's OK. But in fact, Lansdale comes back with a pretty alarming report of Vietnam. And again, I mean, Lansdale breaks with the official line on this. Everyone else is saying things are swell. Lansdale, who understands it, says things are not swell there. All right? Um, in fact, Lansdale says that American intelligence and the Vietnamese uh, are alarmed as well. And so for the first time, the president has, quote, a sense of the danger and urgency of the problem in Vietnam. This is what Walt Ross now says, who attends the meeting also. Right? What's Lansdale's report say? The South at best can only postpone defeat. Defeat is inevitable and right now the way things are going the best they can do is to c delay it a while. They can't stop it, they can delay it a while. Why? Because morale is bad and the nation is simply not prepared to deal with the insurgency. The people are not really behind ZM and Lansdale was a friend of ZM's. They were very close. He was a supporter to the end. Right? So what does Lansdale say? Um, Indochina um, uh, the United States has to send direct aid, immediate aid, to Indochina to stem the problems in southern Vietnam. All right? The National Liberation Front is a serious uh, uh, problem, and it is an internal problem. It's a southern problem. So Lansdale understands this. So as Kennedy looks at the situation in January of 61, he has to deal with the Lansdale mission, just a month before that, the formation of the National Liberation Front. And at the same time, Nikita Khrushchev, and the Soviet Union makes a speech, and he promises that the Soviet Union will support, quote, wars of liberation throughout the third world. OK. 
Okay. When Khrushchev says, we will support wars of liberation, I'll have to write bigger, um, what does that mean? Who is he referring to? Wars of liberation. I mean, he's supposed to, I thought the Soviet Union was supposed to sponsor wars of communist revolution. He's saying wars of liberation. What is that? What's that sound? What's that mean? Push the... Maybe like a, a foil to the U.S. policy as far as supporting popular movements. Popular, I mean, he's talking about popular movements. He's talking about nationalist movements. So he's basically saying not only will we support communist movements, we will support nationalist movements too. So this is a challenge to JFK, right? I mean, he's lost Cuba. He's lost Laos. Khrushchev says, we will support wars of liberation. That summer, Kennedy and Khrushchev meet in Geneva to discuss Berlin. The wall has just gone up. And Kennedy tells Khrushchev to tear the wall down. And Khrushchev essentially mocks him. Kennedy looks like a 42-year-old kid with this slick old Bolshevik there. So Kennedy, you know, really, really has some problems going on. So he has to do something. He has to act somewhere. Okay? So in late January, he approves... The, it's something called the CIP, which is the counterinsurgency plan for Vietnam. Counterinsurgency is a term we'll talk about time and again. The Viet Minh, Viet Cong, National Liberation Front, however you want to refer to them, represent an insurgency. It is a group in the South opposed to the Southern government. So how do you deal with that? Well, the Americans generally deal with things with firepower and technology, but this is different. So what we're going to have to do is create counterinsurgency methods. And this is going to be one of Kennedy's major uh, uh, favorite programs. Kennedy had read some Mao Zedong stuff on revolution, and in fact had created a lot of special forces groups, including a group at Fort Bragg, which wore Green Berets, right. Kennedy created special forces Green Berets counterinsurgency. So he creates, he, uh, um, uh, institutes a counterinsurgency plan for Vietnam, which, is, which means that the United States is going to help the Vietnamese defeat the insurgency. All right? How's it going to do that? It's going to send money, it's going to send trainers, it's going to send know-how. The United States will increase the amount of money it sends to Vietnam so that the Arvin, which is the Southern Army, the Arvin can be increased. That's the Southern Army, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And it also is going to help them increase the CG, the Civic Guard, all right? In addition to that, they're going to send ZM almost $50,000 a year more, which will raise the American total to about $225 million a year. So the U.S. is going to send more troops, more money to Vietnam, so the Vietnamese can have a larger military. In return, what does ZM have to do? ZM has to reform his government. Remember the 1954 letter I wrote, I read to you from Eisenhower to ZM? What did Eisenhower tell ZM he had to do? Reform. What did Jay Lawton Collins say in 55? This guy's not going to do anything. There's no reform there. 1961, you get the same thing. All right? Now, um, uh, I'll read actually a couple more letters in a minute. So uh, the counterinsurgency plan says we need uh, to take a more active role in defeating the insurgency, and ZM needs more money, ZM needs more troops. To kind of put some oomph behind it, in May of 1961, Kennedy gives his vice president something to do, Lyndon Johnson. If you know anything about JFK and LBJ, they don't really like each other very much. Kennedy uh, and Johnson, in fact, had been competitors uh, for the Democratic nomination in 1960. Kennedy won the nomination. Johnson thought that he was kind of corrupt and immoral. <laughs> Uh, he didn't like his father. Uh, in fact, uh, Kennedy offered Johnson the vice presidency because Sam Rayburn had suggested it and really regretted asking him to do that. They thought Johnson would turn it down. Johnson accepted it. And in fact, the day after Johnson accepted, Bobby Kennedy went to LBJ's hotel suite in L.A., where the Democratic Convention was being held, and told him to, to, to refuse it, to turn it down, to change his mind. And Johnson hated Bobby Kennedy more than he hated Jack, and so he told Bobby in very polite terms to please escort himself to the door. And so LBJ becomes vice president. And this is a guy who was quite powerful, Senate Majority Leader, and now he's vice president. And vice presidents traditionally don't do much. I mean, Gore really is quite different in that regard. He actually does stuff. But Johnson was doing nothing. So they sent him to Vietnam in May of 1961. And while in Vietnam, he, of course, meets with Neo Dinh Diem. Isn't that a wonderful picture? And they both have their formal whites on. All right? And the, the key there is Johnson tries to put pressure on ZM to request American, more American aid, including American troops. So the United States is telling the ZM to ask for more American support. Johnson meets with reporters, 
and you know he's six four and ZM's you know barely five six five seven, and he kind of puts his arm around him and his texture out. He says, "Nyo Din ZM is the Winston Churchill of Southeast Asia," and of course he's he's laughing when he says that, right? He can't keep a straight face. On the airplane back, Stanley Carnow, who's a journalist, said. You know, did you mean that stuff you said about Churchill? And they're both laughing, and, and Johnson's reply is, shit, man, he's the only boy we got down here, okay? So, but, but Johnson accomplishes his mission, which is to kind of tell ZM that the United States takes this very seriously, all right? So what happens? You have increased support. Now, these are two more documents, which are interesting. Um, basically, ZM, now this is something that's a bit, we'll talk more about this, and there's a little twist to this. Everyone says ZM is a puppet of the U.S., but in fact, ZM, and this is going to get him in trouble, has deep misgivings about American influence in Vietnam. ZM doesn't want his country to be sold out to the Americans. He is a nationalist in that regard. He's a corrupt, you know, uh, you know what do you call it, a kleptocracy, you know, in, in many ways, but he's a nationalist. That's a lot of people use that term in America to describe their family, a kleptocracy. But he's a nationalist, and he is afraid that the Americans will come in and take over his country. And, in fact, he made those opinions known to LBJ and thereafter. But he also knows who's paying the bill. So um, he and Kennedy exchanged letters in late 1961. And essentially, uh, ZM, and they're both on here, ZM asks for support. Um, uh, he says, if we lose this war, our people will be swallowed by the communist bloc, so on and so forth. Our action is purely defensive, and so on and so forth. And he asks Kennedy for help. As This was scripted. I mean, that's what he was supposed to do. And Kennedy, on December 14th, which is at the bottom here, both letters are on this. There's Kennedy's reply, ZM's letter, Kennedy's reply, December 7th, December 14th. Kennedy's reply says, I've received your recent letter. Um, our indignation about communist violence is as great as yours. In accordance with the Declaration of Geneva, and in response to your request, we are prepared to help the Republic of Vietnam to protect its people and preserve its independence. We shall promptly increase our assistance to your defense effort, as well as help relieve the destruction of the floods, which you describe, and I'll get to that later. I have already given orders to get these programs underway. So the United States, then, is increasing um, its aid to uh, southern Vietnam. All right. So 1961 then is a major year in the American Vietnamese alliance and US support increases progressively throughout that year Kennedy is committed to Vietnam. Why? Well, first of all that's the way he is. He's a cold warrior. He believes in it. In addition to that, Cuba and Laos have given him no choice but to somehow get success somewhere. All right? Anybody have any questions on that part? I'm going to get back to it, but first I want to take a little bit of a detour and talk a bit about Kennedy's relationship with the military, because I think that's very important. One of the great uh, problems, if not tragedies, of Vietnam was that the civilian establishment and the military were uh, at, at war almost themselves uh, throughout this entire period, throughout the entire war. And this is clear from the beginning. Um, Kennedy and the brass have an uneasy relationship from the get-go. Now, Kennedy is committed to Vietnam. Everybody who talks to him understands that. Um, he tells his ambassador, Frederick Nolting, that uh, he's eager that Vietnam should have the highest priority for rapid and energetic action. He tells the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, a man named Lyman Lemnitzer, that uh, uh, or Lemnitzer told McGar that he had just met with Kennedy and, quote, Kennedy is ready to do anything within reason to save Southeast Asia. McGar tells uh, the admiral, uh, the in charge of the uh, Pacific Command, Admiral Harry Felt, Kennedy has repeatedly stated that Vietnam is not to go behind the bamboo curtain under any circumstances, and we must do all that is necessary to prevent this from happening. Okay, so Kennedy tells people around him that he is committed. This is not somebody who has misgivings or he's ambivalent or he's nervous. He is deeply committed to Vietnam, and so in support increases as a result of that. But he's also having problems with his military at the time, all right? Um, as much as anybody, more than anybody actually, the military understands what's happening in southern Vietnam because they're there. There are a lot of American advisors. There are 800 when Kennedy arrives, and within a few months I think that number uh, quintuples. I'm not sure exactly. I think, yeah, I think it goes up to about 4,000 in the first year Kennedy's in office. By 1962 it's up to 11,000 and then uh, 16,000 at Kennedy's death. So Kennedy has a, a tenuous relationship with the military. 
And much of it has to do about what to do in Vietnam. There is a strategic debate which begins early on and, uh, and uh, oh, there we go, isn't that clever? A strategic debate which begins early on and continues throughout the entire war. Lansdale and many others advocate a counterinsurgency approach. However, Kennedy and McNamara and others aren't terribly taken in by that. Kennedy, you know, is an advocate of counterinsurgency, Green Berets and so forth, but in real terms is kind of ambivalent about it. In fact, Lansdale meets with McNamara after he returns and he says, McNamara is very hard to talk to about counterinsurgency. Watching his face as I talked, I got the feeling that he didn't understand me. Why? Counterinsurgency is a different kind of war. McNamara is a, a product of Harvard School of Management, Ford Motor Company. McNamara understands data, computers, technology. Counterinsurgency has to do with emotions, morale, culture, things like that. It means that you give the people a reason to fight. You want the people to oppose the Viet Minh or the Viet Cong on their own. You don't coerce them through technology or weapons. You try to affect their hearts and minds, which is going to be the famous line. You know, we'll, we have to win their hearts and minds. Lansdale believes in this stuff. This is not the way the Americans traditionally fight wars. The Marines have some history of counterinsurgency, but by and large, you know, World War I, World War II, Korea, those are wars fought with firepower, technology, units, tanks, armor, air power, and so forth. And that's how the U.S. is going to fight in Vietnam, too. And Lansdale's saying, this is a different kind of war. We can't fight that way. We need a, a legitimate counterinsurgency approach. And McNamara kind of draws blank. Counterinsurgency? How do, you, how do you determine hearts and minds? You can't put that into the computer, right? McNamara, at one point, it's kind of getting ahead, but one point later on, somebody brings him a memo outlining the reasons why the U.S. should not be in Vietnam. One of his younger assistants, I can't remember which one. And, it, you know, very, very powerful, logically argued argument, you know, uh, uh, memo saying this is, we're having problems, we really shouldn't be there for this reason. And McNamara throws it back at him and he says, where's your data? You know, I don't need any of your damn poetry. I want to see numbers. I want to see hard information. So this is kind of what you're dealing with. So when you talk about counterinsurgency, it kind of draws a blank. Yeah. You have a question? <laughs> oh. I saw your hand go to the thing. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, wasn't there a, um, isn't there kind of a deeper, though, philosophical uh, issue here or, or a political issue about how to um, sell the American involvement there politically if there, if basically the argument is that the United States is coming to the defense of a country, an independent country that has been invaded by another country, mm -hmm. then promoting counterinsurgency as the most effective way undercuts that whole argument because it in inherently admits that the problem is internal mm -hmm. in South Vietnam. The military is looking at the situation going, look, this is what we really need to do to win the war here, at least some of the military. But the politicians are going, this is our argument here. We're trying to stop communist expansion. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they almost had to, they almost had to, oppose or, or at least not not support counterinsurgency as a matter of ideology yeah I think you're exactly right that's a very good point I mean politically you know and LBJ is later pretty candid about that they they can't they can't sell it that way well you know we need to go win their hearts and minds and it might take us 20 years and we're not sure really how to do it you're right I mean you know it has to be fairly black and white yeah these evil people from the north are coming in and trying to take you over and you know we're gonna come to the rescue so I think, you know, ideologically, you're right, pacification, counterinsurgency, whatever you want to call it, is really not, it's pretty foreign to the way Americans think and the way the American military establishment fights. They're wedded to their own concept, they call it the concept, which is essentially conventional warfare. And, you know, for LBJ, or for Kennedy or Johnson to go to the American people and say, well, you know, we're going to send troops and his advisors, and they're going to give the, you know, give, give the kids immunizations, and, you know, they might be there for the next 20 years. I mean, it, it just won't work. And LBJ is quite candid about that. He would very, very bluntly say, look, I can't, I can't sell pacification. And a quote I'm sure I'll use again, Johnson would say pacification is, quote, like a jackass hunkering up in a hailstorm. I don't know what it means, but, but it's good. All right? Yeah. Uh, is pacification... The, uh, the terrorist and the repressive part of counterinsurgency? It shouldn't be. I'm, I'm not clear it's on not the, the way I mean, it's used. Basically, pacification or counterinsurgency, in, uh, what that means is that you have an insurgency. You have a rebel group, not a 
a foreign invader. World War II, I mean, you, you knew who the enemy was. It was the Wehrmacht, it was the Nazi army. Or in the Pacific, it was the Japanese Navy, right? You know who your enemy is, and you can devise strategies and tactics based on conventional concepts you have to fight them, all right? And you know where their units are. You can map them out, and you can put flags, red and blue and green, in various places. And you know where the basic supply routes are and things like that. It's fairly clear cut, all right? Insurgency warfare, that's all out the window because it's hit and run. You'll have small units, maybe five, maybe ten. You might have a division that's not terribly likely, all right? And their goal is surprise, right? So they may attack an airfield or, you know, uh, uh, kidnap the, the local chief or a school teacher, execute somebody who they consider an enemy. And it's much, much harder to plan for that. The goal of the insurgent is to get the people on his side. You know, I want to convince you that the government is repressive, they're not going to help you, and you really should be joining me. So my goal as the insurgent is to win your hearts and minds, to rally you to a popular cause. And in the case of the NLF, it's not that hard to do because what's my trump card? What, is, has, what has ZM done for you? Right? Are you better off now because of ZM? All right? So that's my trump card. So counterinsurgency means that they have to come in, the U.S. in this case has to come in, and take me on on my turf. They can come in and just blow up villages or attack, but, but how do they know who they're killing, right? I mean, it's not like I have an army, you know, massed somewhere, you know, thousands of us that they can just drop a bomb and kill us all at once. They can't do that because I'm in small groups, I'm in cells. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm surreptitious. I mean, I can be in the village. In the day, I'm just a farmer. At night, I put my black pajamas on and I go out and I'll kill the village chief, all right? So... How do you fight? You can't fight. I mean, you can send the tanks and the armor in. What good is that going to do? You can bomb villages, which is what they do. Does that help? Is that how you should fight the war? Lansdale, and we'll talk a lot more about this, is saying, no, you have to take them on in their own terms. You have to go in there and fight them according to insurgents' doctrines, and you should establish your own counterinsurgency program. I have to convince all of you, if I'm the Americans, my goal is to convince all of you that you really should support the ZM government and not the NLF. The NLF are going to turn you into communists, they're going to terrorize you, and so forth. The American line was always that the NLF, and the famous book on this is by guy named Douglas Pike, who was a foreign service officer, it's called the Viet Cong. And Pike's main argument was that the Viet Cong organized and gained influence more than anything by violence and by coercion. I think William Dwyker, David Marr, and others have, I think, over, you know, have, have refuted that fairly effectively. It's real hard for any group to sheer, use sheer violence to gain support and authority. They have to somehow give people a sense that things are going to be better. Yeah. I think particularly the kind of widespread support yeah. and that we see in Vietnam. I mean, there, there were cases, the Viet Cong, I, I said before, were not angels. They would uh, assassinate village officials, teachers, educators. They would blow up schools if they thought that that was, you know, they, they were willing to use that. But I, I, I think that the, the evidence is fairly strong that that was not their main, their main strategy because they really, you know, understood uh, better than, than the, the ZM regime did that they had to have the support, legitimate popular support of the people. So pacification is a synonymous term with counterinsurgency? Pretty much. I mean, there are differences in all these. Throughout the war, there are probably eight to ten different terms used at different times. Nation building, rural development, I mean, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bob, uh, earlier you mentioned, uh, uh, and I'll kind of backtrack a little bit, uh, uh, Kennedy's distrust of the military. Mm -hmm. Now, Kennedy was a former U.S. Naval officer right. in World War II, and is that his distrust stem from his elite, you know, Harvard education and background, or is there something else? Um, I, I'm not sure really what the, the psychology of it is. I mean, in practical terms, uh, the military's going too slow. And he call, oh, the term, the oh, Hillsman, weakness and mush. That's what he refers to the JCS when they talk about Laos. I've never seen such weakness and much. He and Kennedy are disgusted. Basically, okay, which I, I'm always backtracking. We're not going to get through Kennedy, today, but so what? This actually goes back to the 1950s, and this is really interesting stuff. One of Eisenhower's major goals was to balance the budget. How do you do this? You cut what, what area? Defense. You cut military spending. And Ike does this dramatically, not dramatically, he reduces military spending. He goes from 42 million to 34 million, which is almost a quarter, which is almost 25% reduction. And he especially takes money away from which service? The Army, his own people. 
So the military's really ticked off at Eisenhower. And so in the late 50s, the military forms an alliance with the Democratic Party. And Johnson and Kennedy in particular have really good relations with military people like, as I said before, Maxwell Taylor, J. Lawton Collins, James Gavin, and others. And during the campaign, retired military officers speak publicly, Ridgeway, for Kennedy. Kennedy has them campaigning for him. Basically, Kennedy had promised them that they would return to their old budgets if he was elected. Basically, I'm going to increase spending. And the one thing, the military hated McNamara. They despised McNamara, but McNamara fa funded them very well. I mean, by 1961, the budgets were way up there again. McNamara and Kennedy basically said, we'll give you whatever you want. So they had taken care of the military quite good, quite well. Yet, when it comes time to fight, they don't want to. And so Kennedy's basic thinking is, I've given these people everything they've always wanted, and now they're going soft on me. It's weakness and mush. As I say in the book, the Army had done quite successfully in the political war on the Potomac, but they weren't all that interested in fighting a real war in the Mekong. And I think that's kind of the way they see it. You know, We've gotten appropriations out of Kennedy and McNamara. We're back to our position of, stre of prestige and status, Maxwell Taylor, Gavin, and so forth. But we really don't want to fight in these areas. And I mean, it's also based, I don't think it's weakness and much, I think it's based on a fairly sound strategic analysis of Laos and Vietnam. You know, these aren't, you know, I mean, I think if you had said, you know, let's go into China, they'd have said, yeah, you know, or let's go into Russia, sure, but Laos and Vietnam, nah. So I think, I think that's Kennedy's distrust of it. I, it could be this elitism. I mean, Kennedy, you know, he's, he's surrounded by brilliant minds, right? The whiz kids, the best and the brightest, they're all from Harvard. You know, these guys from West Point are, you know, non-coms. You know, what do they know that we don't? So I suspect there may be some hubris, you know, this kind of arrogance in there. But by and large, I think it's this idea. I've given you people everything you want, and now you're hanging me. You're leaving me out to dry. Yeah. And you see this in the strategic debate. When they're talking about counterinsurgency, Kennedy's people just don't understand this, right? Um, and in fact, uh, the military, as much as anybody does, and uh, one of the uh, major advocates of counterinsurgency, a name we'll come back to later, is a guy named Robert Comer. Comer later will take control of all pacification in Vietnam. But Comer in 1961 already recognizes that military plans for Indochina rely on, quote, forces too large and unwieldy for early action. The purpose of U.S. troops, Comer says, is not to fight guerrillas. Comer says, there's no point in sending forces to Vietnam. We're not there to fight guerrillas. We can't do that. That's not our strength. Remember what Ridgway said in 1954 when they were talking about Dien Bien Phu? Gavin said it when he comes back with that 100-page long report. What did both of them say? American units are not suited for warfare in the jungles of Vietnam. We're too ponderous. We're too big. We don't have the kind of tactics. These people have been fighting guerrilla wars for centuries, millennia. We don't belong there. And Comer is saying the same thing, and he says Kennedy doesn't quite get that. Some type of American presence is needed, but not ground troops. Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, essentially believes the same thing. Kennedy believes in a strategy of flexible response, he claims. This is something Maxwell Taylor actually devised. This was a uh, a reaction against Eisenhower's reliance on, on nuclear weapons, the so-called New Look, which said that if it ever came to war, the U.S. would just use all its atomic bombs because it has so many more. And Taylor and Kennedy say, you can't rely on nuclear weapons because what if it's a small war? You're going to nuke everybody? We need to be flexible. We need a flexible response in Vietnam. All right. The flexible response means that we may use pacification. We may use... Uh, uh, conventional types of warfare. We've already really discussed pacification, all right? So Kennedy, at least rhetorically, is saying we need a flexible response. In real terms, however, Kennedy wants to send troops in to Vietnam, all right? And this is very early on. This is from 1961 on. Kennedy believes that ultimately American troops are the key to success in Vietnam. I mean, he you know, basically correctly understands that the ZM regime on its own doesn't have popular backing and by itself probably cannot defeat the NLF, the insurgency. How to deal with it? Well, the military is saying pacification, counterinsurgency, right? Fle real flexible response. Kennedy likes to mouth these words. He likes to create the Green Berets, you know, and he has his picture taken, you know, at Fort Bragg with the Green Berets, and he uses this for PR. In real terms, he doesn't have the same faith in them that he does in the traditional army concept. So who is opposed to the use of troops in Vietnam? It's actually the troops, the military, the American military. Harry Felt, 
who was the uh, commander. He was the Sync Pac. Uh, the military has wonderful acronyms, doesn't it? Sync Pac is Commander in Chief Pacific Forces. And at the time, it's, it's always an admiral. It's, it's Harry Felt is his name. And Felt is really an interesting character, uh, uh, kind of a footnote because he, you know, by the time Vietnam was in full swing, Felt uh, uh, had retired. Um, but Felt was uh, strongly opposed. These are his own words. I am strongly opposed to American troop commitments. Why? Because if we send American troops in, the Vietnamese are going to do less. We will take over responsibility for the war from them. In addition to that, this is an insurgents war in the South. Unless the Pavan, the Northern Army, masses and in conventional formations crosses the 17th parallel, then, and we take them on that way, unless that happens, and that ain't going to happen, we're the aggressor there. We've sent troops into a civil war. We've sent troops in to, to intervene on behalf of one side in a war of national liberation, in a revolution. Whether they're communists or not, people will see us as the aggressor. And the Vietnamese, the southern Vietnamese, the Arvin, will do even less. This is Harry Felt saying this. This isn't George McGovern. This isn't some dove. This is the commander-in-chief of the, the Pacific forces. All right? Felt also says there's a real dilemma here. You better be careful because you're walking a fine line. If you send limited troop support in, then, quote, that will commit us, the U.S., to another Korea-type support and assistance situation. Nobody wants another Korea. Three years, 50,000 dead, just a disaster. However, if American forces intervene in mass, what happens? Quote, we can't pull out at our will without damaging repercussions. It's kind of, remember Admiral A.C. Davis at Dien Bien Phu? It's like going over, you can't go over Niagara Falls in a barrel only slightly. All right? You either go in or you stay out. But if you kind of do this piecemeal thing, it's going to get you deep, more and more deeply committed. And the other side is going to let you take over the war for them. And you can't, you can't get out then. All right? So Harry Felt says we should help the Vietnamese get organized, get trained, give them the military equipment to fight their own war, but keep all American troops out of that country. This is Harry Felt. This is the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific saying this. All right? ZM himself doesn't want American troops. And in fact, Kennedy pressures him uh, to ask for 100,000 more troops. ZM doesn't want them. He doesn't want all these Americans in country. I'm sorry. Kennedy asked ZM to ask for 100,000 expansion in the Arvin and more American troops. He doesn't want to do that, right? So again, ZM is, is kind of a, a, a quite a, 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 a kind of an ambivalent character. So the real question is then are, should we send in troops? Kennedy says yes, the military says no. And whose troops should we send in? Kennedy saying American, and the military saying Vietnamese. So here's a real debate. Vietnamization, which is you know, the Nixon policy in 1969, you've probably heard of it. That was the military's policy in 1961. Basically, they thought it's Vietnam's war, they should fight it. All right? So this is Kennedy's dilemma. What does Kennedy decide to do? Well, he's not going to turn tail and run. All right? Kennedy decides that he has to stay in Vietnam because his credibility is on the line. This is a term that I will come back to time and again. People often say, why Vietnam? Was it economic? We've talked about that before. Was it pure anti-communism? Uh, there's an aspect to that, but I don't think that's the overriding concern. Ultimately, I think what it comes down to is this something you can't really put your hands on. It's kind of vague. Credibility. What's that mean? If you have credibility, then people take you seriously. Your friends rely upon you. Your enemies fear you. America has credibility. They have props. All right? The world takes America seriously because it is powerful. The United States has defended its friends and opposed its foes from 1945 onward in Iran, in Guatemala, in South Asia, in Laos, in Cuba, although half-heartedly. Basically, wherever there's been a struggle, I kind of think of the Tom Jones speech, right? I'll be there. All right? Wherever there's a neutralist in the mountains, I'll be there. Wherever there's somebody talking about land reform, I'll be there. Wherever there's a peasant trying to earn a better life, I'll be there. All right? Basically, this is American credibility. We have status and stature. We are the champion of the free world, as they would call it. But we are the champion, you know, critics might say, the champion of the status quo. Either way, America has credibility. Kennedy understands that. And if the United States doesn't make a stand, then what happens? Its credibility is coming, will come under attack. Our enemies will try to exploit us and take advantage of us, and our friends won't trust us as much. 
So Kennedy understands that America's credibility is on the line. Vietnam by itself doesn't mean much. You know, the problems of Vietnam ain't worth a hill of beans, right? Bogey would say, but in terms of credibility and America's will, America's ability to make a difference in the world, then it's quite important. And especially Kennedy's personal credibility is on the line because what has happened already in 1961, right? In Cuba, in Laos, he meets uh, 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 Khrushchev in Geneva, and Khrushchev refuses to tear down the wall. So what does Kennedy say? He's talking to a reporter. He says, that son of a bitch won't pay any attention to words. He has to see you move. Now we have a problem in making our power credible. No one takes us seriously. No one like think of the Randy Newman song, No One Likes Us, I Don't Know Why. We may be perfect, but hey, we try. Let's drop the big one and see what happens, right? Okay, Kennedy. These are Kennedy's words. He tells us, Scotty Reston, New York Times reporter, now we have a problem in making our power credible, and Vietnam looks like the place to correct it. I mean, in Cuba, in Laos, Berlin, you know, they're smacking us around. We're going to have to make a stand somewhere. We're going to have to show that our power is credible. We're not, as Mao Zedong would later call the United States, a paper tiger. We're not a paper tiger. We're a real, powerful, credible force. And in Vietnam, by God, we're going to prove it. So Kennedy's credibility is on the line. He has to make a stand somewhere. Vietnam has the bad fortune of being the place where that happens. Who said we were a paper tiger with atomic teeth? Was that crucial? That was Mao. Mao? Yeah, that okay. was Mao, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, um, Vietnam has, in many ways, it's, it's bad luck. I mean, this was probably, this is Gabriel Coco's argument, I would agree with him fully. This was going to happen. Some third world nationalist communist movement was bound to develop, and many were. It happened in 53 and 54 in Iran and Guatemala. Those weren't communist movements by any means, but it happens there. And the United States is able to suppress those through covert operations, CIA operations, essentially. It's happening in Cuba, and the U.S. basically gets smacked down at the Bay of Pigs, all right? But it's not giving up. Vietnam is the place it has the bad fortune. This could have happened in the Congo. It could have happened at any point, at many different points along the world, but Vietnam happens to occur at a unique historical time and place. And Kennedy because of his own political ideology, because of his own background, because of the nature of American power in the Cold War, has to act somewhere. And Vietnam has the bad fortune, the bad luck of being the country where it was acted upon. Credibility was not unique to Vietnam. Credibility occurred everywhere. I mean, one could make the argument that credibility was on the line in Mississippi, and in Montgomery, and in Birmingham, and at Little Rock, at home. All right? There are many points where the Cold War flares up, and Vietnam happens to be one of them. So Kennedy's credibility, this is something you, you, know, you can't touch and taste, like Ross Perot would say, you can't touch it and taste it and smell it, but it's nonetheless critically important. And you know, there will be points, and I'll, I'll bring them out, where uh, 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 time and again people will use that word. I mean, the fact is, the word is used quite frequently. Kennedy talks about credibility, Johnson's people talk about it a lot. In fact, there's a famous memorandum, which I'll mention again, by John McNaughton, who's Assistant Secretary of State for International Security Affairs, where he says 70% of the reason we're in Vietnam is to make our power credible. 20% is to send a message to the Soviet Union and not mess with us. Only 10% is to give the people of Vietnam a better life. Now, publicly, what's the reason? It's to give the people of Vietnam a better life. Yeah, 70% and I, at some point down the line, I will actually put this on the web. I'll put the document there. Seventy percent of the reason the U.S. is in Vietnam is to make our power credible. Twenty percent is to send a message to the Soviet Union and the Chinese, you know, don't mess with us. Ten percent to give the people of Vietnam a better life. John McNaughton. He's the Assistant Secretary of State for International Security Affairs in 64. I'm jumping ahead, but that's a good, good, case, good example. And so you're going to see this recognition that credibility is on the line time and again. This poses a problem for JFK, who is staking his credibility on Vietnam because in Vietnam, the situation is getting worse. In fact, by 1961, uh, the ambassador, Frederick Nolting, Frederick Nolting in 1961, 
Cables Washington, quote, if the situation substantially worsens, the United States will be faced with the alternatives of sending forces into South Vietnam or backing down. The State Department says things have gotten so bad, emergency actions are required within 30 days. On the ground, then, in Vietnam, the situation is not going well. William Bundy, who's the Assistant Secretary of Defense for ISA, McNaughton would replace him, said, it is really now or never to stop the Viet Cong. The situation in the South then is going very poorly, so what does Kennedy do? He decides that politically he has to act. Right? And so on October 11th, 1961, he announces another trip to South Vietnam by Maxwell Taylor and Walt Rostow. Right? And these are their, their images. Taylor, this is his official photo as uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I believe. And this is Walt Whitman Rostow, the economist of the Cold War. He's still around at the LBJ Library, in fact, Rostow and Taylor. In October of 61, Taylor and Rostow go to Vietnam, and um, we'll pick it up in a minute. I've got the red light. 